Thank you, Doug and Dennis, and thanks uh, for inviting me. And uh, I want to qualify one thing Doug said. That was a very generous introduction. But I think you can teach that, that working a room. Uh, and I say that only because I, I grew up a pretty shy and introverted person and somehow ended up teaching. And I think by the fact that I took on teaching, it sort of forced me to learn to engage with small and larger audiences. I think one-on-one -on -one was always fairly easy. but working with a larger group I think was a bigger challenge and it's just something you dive into and you know hopefully overcome and get better at over time so I've had enough years now between teaching and practice that uh, hopefully I, I would never describe it as working a room but I, 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 I do think I have uh, some capacity and it's purely I think experience over time of, of working with people but but I think maybe it also has a lot to do with a belief or confidence in what you are about, what you do. Uh, and that also takes time and is a matter of uh, piling up the experience. So tonight, um, for this particular class, what I'm hoping to do is uh, introduce you to, well, you don't need introduction to this because Deanna Balmori did this a few months ago, I guess, or a month and a half ago. But um, I thought in a way, because of the range of projects we do that relate to your topic or topics in this class, that in a way, it's, 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 it's a kind of overview and introduction into landscape architecture. And um, I, I, I'm kind of approaching it this way because I figure you're, this is primarily an undergraduate group of liberal arts majors that span the spectrum from arts through sciences. And um, not all of you know where you're going to end up in 5 or 10 or 15 years. And uh, our program at the University of Virginia, not that I'm plugging ours in particular, but our master's or graduate program in landscape architecture uh, is actually targeted, uh, or was, I'm uh, teaching you now, to people who actually come from um, non-design backgrounds and, and typically liberal arts backgrounds. So it's remarkable how many landscape architects who come through our program uh, have backgrounds in history, biology, environmental sciences, English, etc. cetera. So uh, th this could be a discipline or a profession for a few of you out there. And if just a few of you end up in it, I think that would be a great thing. But another point to be made at the outset is that the great thing about this field uh, that I've learned over time, it's very much about collaboration. And we have had tremendous opportunities in our firm to work with a r great range of professionals uh, like Doug in the fields of uh, civil engineering and, and wildlife biology and ecology and art and sculpture and on and on. So um, it's a very rich and deep field from that point of view. Uh, you can specialize within this field. Um, in very specific areas, and I know the, the world likes us to specialize, but I think one of the things I enjoy most about the practice of landscape architecture is that it, it can be broad-based, very humanist-based, uh, and I resist being overly specialized within it. Uh, and obviously, if there are aspects of, of what we do that need specialists, we know uh, who to work with and, and wh where to go for that. Um, so I, I, I call it the regenerative practice of landscape architecture. You, you know, the three buzzy words that I think we are clearly about in, in our practice and have been for 10, 15 years, 20 years, is uh, sustainability, uh, being sustainable, being regenerative, and being resilient. Um, uh, another plug, we, we, we have a book, our first a book coming, maybe only book coming out in about three weeks, available on a Amazon and other places. Uh, there's the cover. Um, Garden Park Community Farm, and it's, a, it's mostly a kind of glossy picture book. We really wanted it to be kind of attainable, um, accessible to lots of people across the spectrum. So it's some good essays in it, I think, as well. Um, but we made a point in this that we think landscape architecture is about this, these many different things. I'm going to talk mostly about the park and community portion of this. Um, we do a lot of, we did a lot of work initially with gardens, and we still do some. In, with private gardens, but we are trending toward trying to do more and more public work. Um, and then my partner, Thomas Waltz, you see his, his name there, uh, has, has developed a, a side to our practice. It's not so much a side anymore, but it's um, the farm side, which we're calling conservation agriculture. And it's really trying to approach large land holdings, private or public, from a, a, a much more sustainable and regenerative point of view in terms of how you treat that land. So some of you might find that a subset an interesting uh, thing, but I won't dwell on it quite as much. As I said, it takes um, uh, to collaboration and for, for the practice, for the, for the works you're going to see me show tonight, and I'm going to show you a lot of works, um, it, it takes a lot of people. It takes a village or a community. And so this is the, 
some 30 plus of both uh, the, the Charlottesville and the uh, New York office. We have about 30 people in the Charlottesville office and about eight people in New York City and one in San Francisco just starting up the, the California practice. And you can see it's a fairly, fairly young group uh, and, and uh, about 50-50 male-female. Um, <clears throat> for me, the, the, the practice of landscape architecture is very much about combining art and science. Uh, it's about, um, it was an opportunity for me to pr apply uh, my fascination with the natural world but in a creative way. This is a picture of me about 30 years ago with my brother, David, who actually works as a wetland specialist for the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service up in Gloucester. Here we are in the Pine Barrens mucking around, and he's got his field guide in his hand, you'll notice. So uh, the great thing about landscape architecture is it still gives you this chance to be both in the field and in the studio, designing, drawing, thinking, uh, both in, in rooms but also out of doors about how to treat this fabulous environment that we kind of exist within. Uh, one of the tenets that really drives everything we do is to realize that um, it's all watershed based and we're all connected no matter how small a project you might work on, tiny little one acre property or tens of thousands of acres, it's all connected. It's all connected through its hydrology, its soils and hydrology and plant communities uh, and all feeds larger systems. Of course, we're probably, I would say, more hyper aware of that here because of the Chesapeake Bay than almost any other place in the country, but more and more people are catching on. Even still, it's amazing how much damage we do or how much ignorance there is in terms of watershed uh, impacts, as you guys probably already know. Uh, one of the principles about what we do is to really be sure we're designing for our place. As Doug mentioned, we are, are, have a global practice in the sense that, that while we're based in Virginia and, and uh, New York, we work uh, overseas. Uh, most of our work, I would say, still is in the, the East Coast. Um, uh, and in the United States, but we are and have had projects in Canada, in the Mediterranean, in the Caribbean, uh, Mexico, a, uh, China, Moscow, the Netherlands, New Zealand. So we are around. We do uh, pl uh, projects in different places just because we have had some great associations and collaborations with uh, both architects and clients and others. But designing for your place is a fundamental thing for me, a, a point of view, which is to say, uh, if you understand your region, um, and, and, and by the way, Virginia is one of the richest ones I think <laughs> exists in this country, if not in the world, if you understand the physiography and geology and the plant communities, and understand that they are distinct from place to place within even, say, a state like Virginia, uh, then you should design with those in mind. You shouldn't try to make places that look like some other place, and we got enough of that. You know, I think. Uh, most of you probably don't know plants too well, but there's a plant out there that I abhor called the Bradford pear, which you see everywhere. Everybody loves it because it blooms white this time of year. It's, an, it's a cultivar, non-native. It's proved to be a little invasive. But it has this incredible adaptability across zones from two to nine. So people are planting it everywhere as street trees. It's a bad street tree. The problem there is now every place looks like every other place. It's all part of the suburbanization and mauling of America. So point being, uh, no matter where you are in the world, design for a, your specific region, your specific place. Um, so fundamental to how we t t tackle our practice, obviously in the Mid-Atlantic, but elsewhere around the world, is to understand what the problem is. And this is a great quote from 2004, the, the bay, the Chesapeake Bay, suffering from a hardening of the watershed. Uh, it's pretty obvious, right, with all the building that goes on, all the development, all the impervious pavements and roofs, et cetera. So, to understand that, uh, that, like this note about the Chesapeake Bay, that 40% of that main stem was dead zone, unable to support life. I mean, that's outrageous, you know, and, and we, we live in what's one of the most productive estuary, estuary watersheds in the world. So these d diagrams on your right are important for us because you look at how the natural landscape works, and you probably have seen diagrams like this before. For us as designers, it's important to understand the difference between natural and conventional development because what we're trying to do is create a regenerative model that's sort of in between. Uh, we'd love to get back to a natural landscape, but we ha if we're accommodating human activity and settlement, we've got to do something better than the conventional thing that, 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 that takes the water out of the aquifer and pour, pours it into pipes and downstream into roads and sediments, et cetera. So we're aiming to, to design regeneratively in everything we do, again, across a, multi a multitude of scales. So if I start with uh, the idea of the, the garden, uh, house and garden as, as a kind of most basic uh, level of what a, a landscape architect might do and then build back up, 
Here's a case of a project called the, we call it the Tidewater uh, Residence at, on Lynn Haven Bay, not that far from here, near, near Norfolk in Virginia Beach. Uh, obviously a wealthy client, but here the challenge was, you know, they wanted to be right on the water and we convinced them to pull it way back from the water because to take a sustainable strategy about the siting of your house and the development of your landscape. Uh, so here's a case where we tried to minimize lawn, other than a little, some play lawn for their kids. Uh, you tried to use native grasses and, and strictly a native plant palette in relationship to the house. We worked with the architect, Billy McDonough, uh, the author of Cradle to Cradle on that. We've done a number of projects with, with Bill McDonough's uh, team over the years. Uh, we wanted to convey all the water we could from the roof, and we actually had a green roof in between these two higher parts of the house uh, with scuppers that convey water down through a channel and into this wet, wetland pond that we created in relationship to their pool area. Um, so that there was this sense of watching and visibly how water moves through the site and gets absorbed to the site. But the thing I'm probably proudest of is this is the, this was the edge of the property when we started with its Spartina, you know, its native Spartina mosses. And this is exactly what it looks like today, in some ways even better. We actually restored some marsh as part of this project. And just compare this to right next door, and I hope this isn't where one of you guys lives. Um, but Right next door, these, these houses actually developed after uh, the project we worked on. And this is just more, much more typical where the house get, tries to get as close to the water as it can, then it's lawn and then it's riprap, right? Very little native vegetation there. And our point is that that's what's contributing to part of the problem of the bay's sedimentation, et cetera. So we're fighting this uh, at every turn, gar whether it's a garden or it's at the scale of a farm. Uh, w at, on the farms we've worked at in, in Virginia, New York, New Zealand, elsewhere, we're really working hard to reduce the amount of non-native uh, plant and the, and the lack of biodiversity by reintroducing warm season grasses um, and, and, and taking the cattle away from the, uh, uh, or livestock if there is some, away from the, the riparian borders. And fire ecology is very much a part now of what we do or what we specify if we have the right client who's willing to do that. So here's a case of a site at Albemarle County, a 108 acre farm. Uh, which was overgrazed and it was just full of fescue. And over time, over many, many years now, we've been working over 10 years there, we've created this, which is a warm set, set of warm season grasses and, and making it just as beautiful or more beautiful a pastoral kind of place as a farm that almost looks like a painting. Uh, but it's a much more biodiverse place now. Uh, part of it helps that we've taken some of the cattle off this. Um, that. Uh, that kind of project has now been extended to a, a, a project in New Zealand, uh, which frankly deserves an entire lecture. Uh, and this is a project my partner primarily worked on, Thomas Waltz. So in the future, if you're interested in this sort of thing, you should invite him down to talk about this. This is a 4,000 acre property on the North Island near Gisborne. Um, it, uh, that point of land is called Nick's Head. It's where Captain Cook first sighted New Zealand back in the 1700s. Here was an overgrazed sheep farm um, bought up by a private American uh, uh, landholder. And he was, w we worked with him before, um, and he was willing to let us work with him on, on restoring the land. And in this case, it was restoring at a lot of different levels, um, still maintaining and, and improving some of the agricultural practices. So it wasn't taking it out of farming altogether, but we wanted to restore wetlands, which you're sort of seeing in the center there. The, the right-hand peninsula, we actually, sealed off the, the last part of the peninsula with a very high, almost Christo-like fence to create a wildlife habitat for tuatara. A tuatara is an almost dinosauric lizard that is no, no longer endemic to the mainland of New Zealand, but still there's a few specimens on the little islands off of New Zealand. And so this was an opportunity to work with wildlife ecologists and biologists and bring the tuatara back uh, to, this, to, to the mainland of, of New Zealand. And so this is a 20-year project in absolute collaboration with New Zealand scientists and biologists and, and bringing that back. This is a wetland that we restored. It had been cut off from the, from the salt water and now it mixes salt and fresh water and has brought wildlife much more back into the picture. We work, uh, have been working, this one is with McDonough as well, in New, um, the Netherlands in creating a series of projects that are, are, uh, are development projects and mixed use projects of community office, residential, commercial in some cases. Um, but we're trying to figure out ways that we can tie even whatever development we're part of into a larger kind of wildlife corridor. You know, wildlife is important, wildlife habitat, reestablishing that, reconnecting that. So this is an example then of the proposal, which has not yet gone under construction yet, of trying to combine this 
idea of bringing in both the, the agricultural context, but also the natural context, bring water in, uh, 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 clothe the roofs in green, in green as much as we can, harness all the waters we can uh, from the project and reuse them, which we were able to do to some extent on a Vilt project in the Netherlands, which was Nike's European headquarters. And so this is one of the garden courtyards we created using the idea of kind of canal and dike gardens, um, that those round or oval things you see there are actually cisterns that take water uh, off the roof and they reuse that and uh, we also take storm water into these kind of canal gardens. And here it's very much about in integrating the landscape with uh, how people, not just how you recycle water and storm water, but how people use it. So obviously with Nike and its emphasis on athletics and sports, it's important to create a series of outdoor environments. So, but I think that's just, I'm going to remind you of this over and over again, that, is, that what we're doing has to be not just for animals and beauty, but it has to be for people too. So all of us are part of this kind of greater and global community. So we're trying to do as much intermixed uh, and hybrid places as we can as part of this. Now here's a very odd project in a sense for us. We, we don't no normally do zoo projects, but we got an opportunity to, to work on the Asia Trail, a $30 million remake of, of a portion of the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Uh, even though the zoo itself is about 160 acres, this was only about a five to 10 acre project, but they were trying to make a better habitat for the giant pandas, which are one of their major attractions, but also make much better habitats for some of their other animals, particularly Asiatic animals, sloth bear, et cetera, which were in pretty dismal conditions before we started on this project. It's a very sustainably driven project. Uh, you may or may not agree with, with what zoos are about because obviously they contain animals, but uh, what it, for purposes of endangered species and research, it's, it's still a kind of necessity. So you do the best you can, I guess is the point when, as a landscape architect. In our case, what was, it, what was fascinating is we're trying to create simultaneously um, an Asiatic environment and yet fit it into Rock Creek Park. So we, we're, we're intermingling constantly two sets of species. Now normally we like to emphasize uh, native species 80 to 90 percent of what we do, uh, but here's a case where because we're also trying to signal uh, and, and suggest for the animals benefit their own kind of world that we had to have a, a good an ample mix of Asiatic species uh, that were in some cases contained or controlled. So here are the kind of animals, the red panda, the sloth bear on the lower left, the giant panda. And it, it, what's fascinating about the Asia Trail working with the staff of zoo scientists and animal behavioralists was that were, you know, how can we make habitats that are more fitting for the animals but still people can enjoy? How can we make habitats that we, we create qualities in those ha animal habitats that even people can experience to some extent? And also how can we create habitats that we can actually work with animal enrichment, which is, you know, how to, how to keep the animals engaged in an otherwise contained environment. So these are actually all photographs from the, the built environment we made for them. So, but obviously it's made to look like it's back home. We also had to create a human habitat of this major uh, pedestrian corridor. So we kind of used a skeletal-like structure uh, to, for this bamboo. Now normally we would never use bamboo, but guess what you know, giant pandas and red pandas feed off of 99.9% .9 of the time is, pan is bamboo. And that's very much a kind of dominant Asiatic species. So uh, in a contained way, we use bamboo extensively to tell a, a very particular story. Uh, so, you know, you want to make an environment that, again, feels natural, but also you, you feel that, the, that there is a presence of the people viewing in. One of the tenets of good practice in zoo design these days, a more informed uh, practice, is try to make habitats where the animals can be above the humans rather than humans always looking down at the animals. That gives them a, a kind of position of authority. So you're looking up, they're looking down at you. And, and, and I think that's a kind of good thing within, again, a very constrained environment to do. Uh, here's an interesting thing as part of animal enrichment was we actually built an enclosure and built these um, uh, sort of faux termite mounds. Sloth bears love termites. And you, the, the, the zoo specialists would have a tube, and we designed this so you could actually insert the tube into that termite mound, which was hollowed out, and then feed them larvae and grubs, and they suck termite mounds, and you can actually put your hand there, kids can put their hand, I put my hand there, and feel the suction of the sloth bear. And there's, there's just something kind of special about just slightly entering their world that way. I mean, it's, it's quite uh, visceral and magical at the same time. I mentioned trying to create habitats 
that could be shared by both. So habitat cooling fog, which was good for the animals, but also part of the character of that misty uh, part of uh, Sichuan and elsewhere in China, where you find red pandas and giant pandas. So we created that for their habitat, but we also let it spill out into the human habitat so people could experience that as well. Ultimately, as I said, it's trying to create a, an environment that feels more natural to them, uh, allows people to view them. But you know, I think our, our success for us is you, you look at these views of this created environment we made, and we think it feels natural, and just see the, the mother and the, and the cub play makes us feel like we're doing the right thing. And, and what has made us feel even more like we're doing the right thing is shortly after this was built and got its plenty of uh, praise, the Chinese called us and they asked us, invited us over to Wolong to design the habitats for their pandas in their quote unquote natural environment. You know, there's only a thousand pandas left in the wild. So they have a major research program. They of course lend the pandas to the United States and other countries. So they invited us over to, to where the pandas actually come from. And we worked for about a year and a half with them on creating a new environment for their pandas because this is the environment that they kept their pandas in. And it was a pretty dismal environment. It kind of felt like, you know, 50s stuff and was not in any way progressive. It was pretty austere, pretty mean. And so I think they saw what we had done in, in the, at the National Zoo and felt like, you know, this is a very positive thing to make a more natural environment and these people can help us do that. So just a little snippet of, here was the setting we were given to create this environment for the giant pandas. And by the way, this was a, a combination of a, they didn't ever call it a zoo, but it really was, they had imagined 10 million or 20 million Chinese coming to visit this place. But it would also have a kind of research and breeding center nearby. So it had to, again, have natural qualities, but it also had to accommodate a lot of, of visitation, a lot of people. That's a challenging thing and not make it look like an amusement park. Um, now, in China, they give you these opportunities you can't believe. So we're, we weren't just designing the panda habitat, uh, Panda habitat up at Dunglesau on the right-hand side, but they asked, oh, "Could you design this, design this eco village, uh, eco village and farmers market, and even maybe the town before you get there?" Because the town was kind of you know, kind of collapsing. So we were designing like at every scale. And, and by the way, this sketch I did, we did over a weekend while we were in China. So we didn't get, they didn't give us much time to kind of come up with concepts. This is another quick con set of concept sketches I did for the actual panda habitat, trying to show how we try to deal with topography. And, and designed in different conditions of stream and valley, waterfall and canyon, et cetera. Uh, it's pretty, pretty uh, ambitious and, and daunting to be <laughs> given these tasks and only like a week to do it uh, before they review it and then finally accepted us and then we kind of moved on from there. Um, what was interesting about the site they gave us, it wasn't a totally natural site. It was a, a, a semi-occupied uh, or abandoned site, some rural farmers. Um, and so what we were trying to do, which is a, took a little convincing, we said, since we're trying to combine uh, natural habitat for the animals with human habitat, why don't we incorporate some of the vernacular architecture and some of the vernacular stone walls for these terraces into our design project? So um, this is what we came up with. I won't spend too much time with it, but it's, it also is trying to accommodate ecotourism and a botanic garden and a conference center try to retain the farm terraces and make actually more of them so they could be producing food for the cafes that are part of this. And then there would be this kind of village core you see in the center there of new buildings, but based on some of the old uh, vernacular architecture. And then the, the actual panda habitat would be in center would be from the center on up the mountain. And there'd be multiple ways to work throughout it. We did design, and we have architects as well as landscape architects and our staff, we designed the buildings for this as well. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that they were as sustainable as they could be. So again, green roofs and cisterns and harnessing the water throughout and using local food uh, in the cafes. This is just a glimpse of one of the barn structures and how we try to adapt that into the new structure for the Panda Center uh, uh, and, and at Dunglesau. And then just a couple snippets of the sections, the proposed sections. And maybe the point, if you look closely at this, is, is it, it's really about trying to place people within what feels more like a panda context than pandas within a people context. And so even this next one might even show that better, where the people are kind of embedded and the pandas really climbing right over top of them in some cases. So you try not to flip the, the, the normal approach to how, you, how zoos are typically made or, or habitats are typically made. OK, another habitat, uh, back onto human communities. This is a. Uh, 
a project in uh, 500 acres on the panhandle of Florida that we worked on right next to Seaside, which was one of the early new urbanist communities. And it was one of our first opportunities to do a master plan. This started about 15 years ago that we got to take all the way down to the level of detail of designing specific parks. And the great thing here was to try to incorporate a, as much of the natural systems, ecosystems, and to use and uh, uh, stormwater as, as positively and productively as we could. You know, one of the strategies we took here um, was to say for the, uh, we really make the housing dense uh, and they'll have small plots, but they could have no grass, no lawn, because that's labor intensive and energy intensive. The only lawn areas would be in the public domain for gatherings and fields, et cetera. Uh, we did as much as we could to retain uh, native uh, plants and trees as possible, which was actually, uh, th nowadays doesn't sound so remarkable, but 15 years ago, believe it or not, that was not the norm on the coast of Florida. Normally it was just scrape the thing clean and then plant palm trees and oleanders, things that weren't native necessarily. And we just spent a lot of time on the site and said it's got some fabulous natural conditions and we think those ought to be, be what you speak to here. What, what, it'll actually distinguish this place and, and ultimately it has. And this just shows you a, a watercolor of our uh, open space system in relationship to the lots and the houses. And one of the points was to take a look at this place and realize that even though it was a relatively flat landscape, that there were the, the micro topography, the slight rise in topography made a huge difference in the plant community. So you had normally flat and wet uh, uh, land, which was, you see on the bottom, which was uh, slash or longleaf pines with, with uh, palmettos. But on the slight rises where it got sandier and drier, you had this wonderfully expressive sinuosity of the sand live oaks and sand pines, but also with the palmetto here. So this almost from a design point of view or artistic point of view or sculptural point of view, just to note the distinction between verticality and sinuosity was something we wanted to play up in the plant palette, but also in the design of places. Uh, so we created stormwater ponds that would look natural in some cases and or in other cases look deliberately human designed. Um, in places where we're trying to protect the wetlands and work with the kind of uh, natural conditions, we really wove our boardwalks in with a tremendous, almost exaggerated sinuosity, which we thought was appropriate to the way those kind of creeks work there and the way the wetlands work. But that's in contrast to the more developed areas in the center where we created something more garden-like and canal-like, which in our minds had its allusions to, or connections to agriculture and irrigation as much as it had to do with gardens. Uh, so in making that kind of central garden spine in the central park, three acre park, we also packed it with native uh, and, and annual and perennials that were real wildlife and pollinator attractors. And it turns out this is on the monarch flyway. So if you go down there in October, November, it's just covered with monarch, uh, monarchs. So here's the central park. And I consider it one of the, my, my greater victories in, in, in my design career because it's about a three acre rectangle or wedge of land. And originally, full of, it was full, originally full of trees. The developer and the architect wanted to clear it completely and just line it with trees, because that's what you do for a classic village green. And then I said, well, gosh, you know, there's some nice existing trees and shrub clusters here, and uh, maybe we could do a village green, but it doesn't have to look like a typical village green. And maybe we could reintroduce water here, because water is very central to this place. It's a very important thing to this place, and it could be part of the stormwater story as well. So I, we showed them some sketches. They bought into it, and so he, this is what they, they built. And, uh, it's been a huge success. People love to come here to get their pictures taken. W one of the reasons it's successful is because it operates, we think, really well you know, w when, when you look at it like this or when just a few people are there, but it accommodates the village. It accommodates a crowd. So it's big enough that the, the community can come together for, for events uh, that they have from time to time. And so as long as you can, and I think you've got to keep that in mind. You're trying to strike that balance between heavy and light use and incorporation of nature, but also incorporation of people uh, at different times of the year. Another one of the projects, Doug alluded to this one already, and I won't talk about this as much as I'd probably like to, um, but uh, Flight 93 was a national competition. Um, we came in more at the second round and we did win it with uh, Paul Murdoch's uh, firm um, over the, those 1,100 and ultimately five finalists. Um, and it was, a, it was a pretty tough and tight competition and, and very, it's a very emotional project. I, I st one of the things I didn't say at the outset that I should have is that <clears throat> one of the things I'm beginning to see about much of what we do is that we're trying to create some combination of healing and healthy landscapes. Really, that's really embedded in the term regenerative. 
And really, Flight 93, uh, even though it's a very different kind of project than most of the other ones I've showed, showed you or will show you, uh, it's a healing landscape. You're not only healing because of what happened there in terms of the plane crash, the, the 40 heroes, um, really an act of war that we're commemorating there, but it was a mine site. It was a strip mine site. And um, though the crash site's only about 40 acres, uh, the memorial site uh, that embraces that crash site is about 120, 200 acres, but the entire site is uh, 2,000 acres. In other words, the Park Service has acquired 2,000 acres to make it a national memorial park, as I note here. So I'm trying to show you what it looked like when we started in 2005. It's still ongoing. Uh, we've only built the first phase. There's two more phases to go. But here's what it looked like, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, that same site was like that. So in total upheaval because they were strip mining it. So this is a site uh, in, in active restoration and we're now restoring it even in a more dramatic way for its healing pr properties as a memorial but also from the landscape's point of view. This is giving you an idea of our, our competition boards, uh, our ideas about uh, kind of regenerating that landscape, bringing back native plants in a lot of ways but most of all celebrating or commemorating the 40 people that died in some, some way that seemed, it really honored them in a, in a truly dignified way. Uh, we also, you know, typically when we do a project, we're trying to acknowledge the, all the seasons, if you're on the East Coast anyway. Um, in this case, we're trying to suggest the seasons really are about when you might most particularly go to this site to honor those who died. Memorial Day, Independence Day, September 11th, and Veterans Day, and that, the, that we would think about how we would compose the meadow and plant palette based on, on those days. Um, so here's the site under construction about two years ago, just to give you a sense of the scale of this. This is about a $60 million project altogether. First phase was about 20 million. We're in the midst of a second $30 million phase and then the final $10 million phase, but it's massive. The entry road itself is three miles long just to get to this uh, circuit or circle. Uh, the crash site itself is, um, just so you know, you'll see it in another diagram, is right down um, here. Uh, so the idea is you come in and you uh, get a line to the crash site, but you actually will drive either around to here or you get the visitor center off here and, and you walk your way down to the, to the actual crash site. Uh, this is an oblique view of that. And there are some wetlands there on site, some ponds and wetlands that we're working with as well. This is in Western Pennsylvania, Laurel Highlands, so it's about 2,500 foot elevation. This is the diagram, and there's the flight path um, that the plane came in on, it came in upside down, crashed in these 40, 50 acres here. And so what we did is we, uh, and the, the coroner established this edge, so that became this kind of bent edge to the sacred or burial ground. And then what we wanted to do was create a field of honor by flanking it with uh, alley of trees, native trees, and then 40 groves, one grove to represent each uh, of the people that lost their lives there. And what's interesting about that is you, you, some people might have thought we well, do 40 trees, but the risk of 40 trees is if one dies, you know, but 40 groves, that means, you know, if a tree dies in a grove, you still have 40 groves. So, I mean, you laugh, but that's, you have to think about those things. And um, so this was a pro it, it, it's been a, gr a tremendous privilege to work on this, but it's not been an easy project because of uh, a combination of things, the bureaucracy of the National Park Service, bless their heart. Uh, but you have 40 families you're working with as well. Uh, it's also a matter of raising money. And I remember uh, one of the things about the, that, that I wouldn't have necessarily predicted, maybe I should have, but I was on a conference call with the families, and this is probably now five years ago, just about what we're gonna do with the sacred ground. And you know, our thought was we wanted to convert it to a wildflower meadow. By the way, the sacred ground is off limits to the public. They can view into it. Only the families are allowed into that when they come, uh, which is right. It's a burial ground. It's like a cemetery. So um, we said we want to do wildflowers, you know, do a native wildflower meadow. And they almost to a person said, no, leave it as it is. It's raw. For, their motions were raw. They didn't want it changed one bit. And I had to kind of somehow gently say, but well, two things. One is, it won't stay that way. Succession will not allow it to stay that way. It has to be managed or maintained, which they weren't thinking. They were thinking it would just be as it was. Um, and they, they would obviously not like the idea of black locusts and other things growing up over time and filling that field. So they ultimately begrudgingly gave you know, us the right to manage it over time a little bit. But the other thing is to think about in 50 years when those families have passed on, you know, that people won't know that history as well. So, 
you know, how you invest a place with some lasting and enduring power and beauty. Because at 50 years, people come in, if it's, if it's raw it, and, and unkempt, people are not going to understand that entirely in the same way the family does. So it's one of those things where it's almost too close to the time and you just need a little distance um, for, for that sort of thing to kind of work. Here's one of the renderings done to show the first phase, the memorial wall, the gate to the sacred ground. Um, this is it uh, during the 10 year anniversary, which was actually the inauguration and the opening of the first phase. Um, and you see the people in the sacred ground, that, those are the family members and everybody else from the public is outside of that. We simply created a, a, a kind of moat-like wall to separate uh, the public from the sacred ground. It was a very moving day. It was actually a two-day ceremony. The first day, um, Clinton and Bush and Biden and others were there and spoke quite movingly. There were 20,000 people on that site. Um, the next day, the Obamas came uh, to lay uh, a wreath and, and visit the edge. They did not go into the sacred ground. Um, but to be part of a, a place that, the, that these, the families come to uh, with regularity and, and, and our, our leaders, our politicians come to as well and speak so movingly, it was, it was great to be a part of. Uh, and, and for us, it's a long-term project. It's probably going to be, for us, 15 years of work um, uh, before it's all fi finally finished. But we are in the process of converting these this damaged land in multiple ways into something that is, is more uh, productive and sustainable and regenerative. And this is uh, for phase two, the, uh, the, the uh, red maple LA. Red maple is one of the most um, um, common native trees in that particular area. So we thought that would be a vivid uh, fall expression uh, of this place, of that arc that frames the field of honor with the 40 groves behind it. Um, then from, from the sublime, not to the ridiculous, but to something different, uh, just to give you the, get this, the scope of this range. This is a project we completed a just a few years ago in downtown St. Louis called City Garden. It's a three acre, two block sculpture garden, urban sculpture garden and park and sort of quasi botanic garden. On the left, you see the existing site, two bl almost blank lawn panels. Um, flanked by very tall buildings, and on the right is the completed garden uh, we, we, project we did in about two and a half years. And you see its relationship to the Saarinen's uh, archway to the east, uh, right on the uh, Mississippi River. Um, this was a project sponsored by a, a, a private foundation, the Gateway Foundation, who wanted to celebrate uh, public art uh, in the city. And the city didn't have much money to do much with parks, so they, they committed, you would not believe how much money they spent. They spent $25 million on these three acres. So what I'm gonna to try to show you is how, what we thought about how we constructed or designed these three acres so that they were a public place for everybody, somehow absorbed 25 significant uh, pieces of art, uh, allowed people to use it in lots of different ways and still had a sense of regionality or locality and uh, sustainability to it. So one thought was, okay, within these two blocks or three acres, there was a little bit of topography, not much, six feet. We exaggerated that a little bit. But let's, let's look at the local you know, physiography and sort of treat one part of this like an upland forest, one part uh, open in the center as, as kind of the floodplain, and the, the southern part as a kind of a river terrace, using um, the local, you know, St. Louis at the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi River, and some pretty stunning hydrologic and geologic conditions there. So, our plan then was really, tr and our, our I design ideas was to kind of reflect the great limestone art uh, 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 bluffs and the meanders and oxbows that you see when you fly over. So here's the Mississippi River and these great limestone uh, bluffs emerging along that and the seeps and the, uh, the washes and the waterfalls that come off of those limestone bluffs. Here's the kind of aerial view of, of the, uh, Mississippi kind of uh, deltas uh, and oxbows and soil maps that reflect you know, what happens over, over geologic time as these, as these river basins change uh, in terms of their flow and direction. And we thought this is a great inspiration to bring into uh, downtown St. Louis to celebrate what's, what's local, but you know, what's, what's maybe somewhat lost or people don't see as often. So there you see it in our kind of oblique once it was built. And so what we did, we translated that bluff into this kind of very high limestone, uh, locally quarried limestone wall that gave us a six foot separation between the upland forest where the cafe is, you see on the right side, and the kind of open floodplain in the center. 
and then the, the, the low 18 inch seat wall was our representation of those river meanders and oxbows and that becomes a great demarcation between the more planted or horticultural side and the open lawn side, a great place for people to sit and a great place also to create niches for certain sculptures. You could also see in this slide <coughs> where we made the cafe, it has a roof garden and the maintenance building over here also has uh, a, a green roof, sorry, green, not a roof garden, but a green roof. Uh, we also incorporated rain gardens uh, as part of the, the, the body of the park itself. So here's the existing conditions. Uh, here's his, uh, w how he changed it. Uh, one of the entryways into it introduces a, a, a major piece of sculpture on a slightly tilted plane that has a scrim of water that people can walk across and get engaged in. The six foot waterfall or five foot waterfall is very visceral and, and families use it. We wanted people to engage it and actually to the client's great credit, they wanted as much of this uh, sculpture garden or park accessible and by that they didn't mean just ADA accessible. They meant everybody able to touch all the sculpture that's so rare. Most sculpture gardens they do not touch. So the water was touchable and occupiable and, and as were the sculptures. And it's become an incredibly popular place. People come to get their wedding pictures done here, their high school graduation pictures done here. Uh, bands come here for their cover art. It's just <laughs> kind of remarkable. There is a big video screen that was part of the uh, art and sculpture component. We, what we did is do a kind of setback quarry-like piece uh, that you can sit within, both looking out and looking in. And now a lot of times school groups come and use that uh, as a gathering point and lecturing point before they walk off to other parts of the park or the garden. You can see here how the meander wall, granite topped, helps to inframe or enclose some of the sculpture. Uh, but it also is a great place for people to come, particularly in the shaded areas, for lunch. It's a really popular place at lunch, but it's popular year-round now. Uh, this is totally unexpected. The police academy now uses it, comes running through and exercises off that meander wall. That's a great happenstance of what we do. You know, you create enough opportunities and places for people, all scales, all sizes, uh, and, they, and they use it. This is a great promenade we created on the south side, uh, opening up to the archway and the kind of historic courthouse there. Again, trying to keep seasonality in mind, uh, the different seasons, because St. Louis is roughly in the same latitude as we are. Uh, accessibility on the urban side, with, by literally embedding a ramp within the steps so there's no railing. And one, if you're in a wheelchair, you don't feel so separated or isolated. You feel like a part of what everybody else's experience. The upper cafe meant to be very transparent with its green roof on top uh, and, and overlooking the park and again, shaded. Here's our sustainability diagram about how we're kind of managing water on site. Uh, again, it's gr the green roofs, in some cases porous pavement, and in other cases rain gardens. And we did two types of rain gardens, one that takes water off the, s the site itself um, and one that takes water off the central street. And that's two different kinds of waters because the street water, as you know, is a lot messier full of oils and sediments that wouldn't be on the site. Here's a rain garden. And my point about rain gardens I've been trying to promote for a long time. I, I, typical rain gardens that are done uh, uh, both at a homeowner scale and even a bigger scale, even like the one outside the business school here, they're, they're kind of just neither here nor there. They're little patchy things. And I think they can be designed, they can be artistic, they can be powerful p uh, presences in, in a particular place. So what we did here is we lined our very rectangular rain garden with panicum switchgrass because that's a year, you know that's there year round it has different colorations and then embedded in the middle of it are flat uh, native flowers like bee balm and ronocastrum that come up and down so they can disappear but you still have a kind of structure to the place <coughs> it's also a very nice happenstance that one of the sculptures was that we placed was the ricky which is a wind activated sculpture and so it's kind of wonderful to see this metal metallic stainless steel sculpture moving with the wind and the grasses moving with the wind so nice combination of art and plants there. Here you see it in the winter, but the grasses are still quite beautiful, I think. And, uh, and also in winter uh, on the left, um, and then uh, with a digital sculpture, and then on the right, the, this is actually the street rain gardens, both of these are, with the cardinal flower, uh, lobelia and juncus, and red twig dogwood. But trying to, again, that incorporation or intermixing, it's not saying, okay, the rain garden's over there, and sculpture's over there, and people are over there, but it's like, yeah, mix them all up, you know, get people to engage in all these things. Ultimately, it was a sculpture garden, so it was about how do we get the people in and around the sculptures, how do they use it. My favorite story is this girl, when I, we were here for opening day, there was a big smudge, black smudge from somebody's shoe on this white rabbit, and I kind of noted that to my wife, and this girl was right next to us, and she heard us say that. She went over and just cleaned it up and then hopped on board. And I thought, 
if they're taking care of it themselves. I mean, what you, could, you couldn't ask for more than that. You know, they're policing it themselves. We, did be, we built these musical chimes in the pavement so the kids and adults can literally play tunes. Uh, I don't know if you've seen those before. And then this, uh, the different kinds of water, the long canal with the waterfall, and then this 104 spray jet fountain, which is the most popular place where everybody congregates. And the greatest thing about City Garden is really how it's um, really brought all the citizens of St. Louis, rich, poor, black, white, old, young together. And without anybody asking, they just came to this. There was, there was such a need for this. And it's been an incredible success. Um, if you go to St. Louis now, I mean, there are people who say it's the greatest thing that's happened to St. Louis publicly since the arch, and we're honored that they would ever put it at that level. So, and again, happenstance. We created this little oxbow uh, pool for, for that sculpture that's in the middle, thinking it'd be a great little, nice little reflecting piece, <laughs> but it's become a little swimming pool for the kids. And we actually saw a parent once that had their kids swing laps around it. It's like crazy. <laughs> Not expected, but desperate. They're desperate for this sort of thing here, you know, and Again, it's, it's about having, making the kind of place that brings people together, a place of, of entertainment and spectacle and, and beauty. Uh, the last set of things I'll show you before shutting up are a series of, of institutional projects or campus projects. Um, this is the one that we, we're, we are currently still working with Doug, uh, Professor DeBerry on at Auburn University. Um, and we're working kind of off of a Sasaki master plan, but our, our charge is to do a landscape master plan that incorporates uh, uh, attention to biodiversity, which Doug, uh, Doug and his team have been working on, and attention to stormwater, which his team's working on as well. And one of our thoughts was to acknowledge or understand that there's a historic part of this campus, uh, a more urban part, that then connects and relates to a less urban part, really an agricultural part. And our, our, our fascination with Auburn is it's a land-grant school, so agriculture and forestry are just as important as, as any of the liberal arts. So how can that feel like a greater part of, of the community of the university as it grows and sprawls and, and really make a, an acknowledgement that there are distinct quadrants or areas to the campus that they didn't even realize they had set up that we could actually embrace or make more of. Um, and part of that then is a kind of first time thinking for them is to look at their campus and say, so the part that's developed or overdeveloped we need to have some strategies of urban ecology that might be different than the parts that are less developed where we can do more preservation and restoration, which is what this diagram is showing. And really, uh, the most important thing we think we're doing here is acknowledging the historic growth of Auburn from a very tight campus to now with the advent of the car 50, 60, 70 years ago and suburbanization. It's a sprawling campus that has kind of consumed or even overwhelmed its natural systems, has this one creek that runs through the center of it, but it's virtually lost. It's half piped. Um, so we're suggesting that they need to re-acknowledge that creek, in some cases take it out, daylight it, uh, or, or st strategize about urban ecologies, rain gardens, and porous pavement that could really bring that stream back to life. And there could be a more of a complementary relationship between what's built and what the, the, the building built environment that students and faculty and staff occupy in the natural environment. And, but they don't, they're not necessarily separate, they're integrated. They need to just be better integrated. And that's certainly going to be the case with you guys, with the Eco Village and, and Crim Dell. And you, know, you have a campus here that has this wonderful, natural, somewhat compromised corridor coming into the heart of things that should be better, I think, acknowledged and embraced perhaps than it is. So this is one of our a landscape framework visions that takes some of Doug's research and studies um, uh, the, on, on biodiversity and ecology as well as the stormwater and says let's reassert the presence of Parkerson Mill Creek and its tributaries so it is as important a corridor as some of the major pedestrian routes and, and vehicle routes through campus. And they're very excited now about that as a strategy and so we're going to go forward from there on some more specific projects including some revitalization of uh, areas that the stream is buried in pipes. Uh, in fact, buildings are built over it. They're going to tear down and they're going to try to bring the stream back. Yay. So we're also working um, at, at Georgia Tech. Uh, we just completed a, a, la a smaller landscape master plan for a portion of Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And here's a case where we're trying to develop a strategy uh, uh, that they've been working on for a while, what they're calling the Eco Commons. But the idea of having uh, a kind of corridor of landscape uh, come through the campus, would only have remnants of right now. And part of its the strategy 
which I think every campus tries to, is trying to be about, but, uh, but, and Auburn's getting good at this, and, and Georgia Tech is getting good at this, is to make it more pedestrian by just taking away surface parking and using that either as good building pads or even better, landscape uh, or, or open space. So that's what we're about trying to do here. And part of doing that is to go back and look at the historic hydrology. I mean, we try to do that on every project where we can. Look at the old maps, look at the old lithographs, Figure out where your site is relative to where it was 50, 100, 150 years ago and see what's been lost, see what might be brought back. We like to talk about it as remnant or lost landscapes. Can some of that be resurrected? I mean, you never can kind of repeat the past completely, but you can certainly make sense of recalling aspects of the past uh, from a hydrologic or otherwise point of view. We had multiple strategies. I won't explain those. The one that was chosen was the one on the left. Uh, we did study things like uh, what's the pedestrian system look like and where is it shaded and where is it not? Now, if you're in Atlanta, you, shade is paramount. I mean, it's not a bad thing here either, but I really need it in Atlanta. So we wanted to make sure we could restitch some of these walkways and new walkways back together in a shaded way. Uh, we also had a series of stormwater strategies throughout the site that, that were anywhere from porous pavement to rain gardens to cisterns underground to daylighting the stream to ponding in certain places. Um, we, had, we did a series of before and afters, so you always on the top you'll see the existing condition and the proposed condition. And this first one's very simple, which just deals with can we make this pretty austere walkway and, and lawn area into something a little more engaging and shaded, uh, which you still need some lawn area on campuses, but you may not need as much as you think. There's a lot of leftover space that's not used, so we think they could, that kind of space, like on the right under the trees, could be more forest-like, more native, uh, more native ground covers. Here's a case above where you have lawn and, and um, utilities, et cetera, piped stuff. And we said we'll pull that out of the pipe and create a series of rain gardens and bioretention basins coming down this corridor, celebrate the kind of movement of water uh, during rain events uh, and, and just make it a more engaging and biodiverse and natural environment. A lot of cases of transforming parking that you see above into usable outdoor space. This, in this case, it's a lawn because it'll be in relationship to dorms and you need some usable space as part of that. So, uh, or how about this parking lot into uh, a series of, of uh, little stream channels with weirs and a walkway next to it. So that's quite a transformation, but what a, you know, a major transformation that is from parking to something like that. Uh, so I'll conclude with the University of Virginia because here we've actually built some of these projects. I'll show you two. Uh, a very small one, Campbell Hall, which is at the School of Architecture, which is really just about conveying water and into a series of small bioretention and rain garden basins. And then conclude with the Dell, which is a much larger stormwater project, which has some parallels to things you might be looking at or doing here. At Campbell Hall, it was about how we could take, in a very small area, just a couple acres, take water off the roof and off par uh, per impervious areas, parking, uh, newly built areas and, and transfer that through the, this new site because they, they were doing a building addition and we did the landscape for it into a series of basins that could catch that water, which is what the diagram on the right is showing and the photograph on the left is showing. There's also a little aside that studying the kind of relationship to the remnant forest right next to this addition, realizing that there's, there's a distinct set of trophic levels, canopy, subcanopy, understory, um, ground, uh, shrub and ground cover. And they kind of relate to our four-story architecture school. So, so there was a lot of conversation and collaboration between me and the architect about how that thinking could in, inform and influence the architecture. So in fact, he, did, he created a series of baffles that were meant to be photovoltaic, eventually will be, but right now just kind of manage the sun angles and the wind. But he was trying to model that and the facade somewhat on the idea of trees and leaves and branches, et cetera, and different levels and layers. On the, uh, you see on the left-hand slide, we created this very slot space, outdoor classroom, broke out of the building there. Um, and the, on the right side of that left-hand slide, you see this little panel of revealed stone, which you see a detail of on, on the right image. There it was a matter of capturing the upper water and literally conveying it through this stone, through a scupper, into this channel of gravel during a rain event. So that water is just rain event. It's not recirculated water. It's natural water. W the point is we're trying to daylight it. We're trying to convey it trying to make it obvious rather than buried. And then the final series of basins, this is a sketch I did of a before. This is what the site looked like under construction with gabion walls and weirs. This is, what ha this is what it looked like right after it was planted and a storm hit. And you can see how the water comes through 
the measured kind of openings in there, but most of the water backs up and infiltrates and drops sediment out. This is what it looked like six months into it. And, and then my point here is that you can create these magical places using a very limited plant, native plant palette that for part of the year reveals the infrastructure, i.e. these weirs that hold back the water, or retain it, allow it to infiltrate. But then in, in, the, in the summer and in early fall, it, it looks like this as the cardinal flower comes up, the native uh, wildflowers, the native grasses come up, and the infrastructure now is completely gone. So it just looks like a wild native garden. So there's a great ebb and flow, a great dynamic to this very small space. Finally, the Dell. Uh, the Dell is about a 10 acre project, but within a 200 acre watershed of Meadow Creek. And, and here's a case where we're, we were doing the first demonstration project for a larger stormwater master plan for the University of Virginia that was done probably about now, about 12 years ago. And we, we did this about five, six years ago. So it's been in place, I think, now six years. Uh, you see its relationship to the lawn, which is in the foreground of the upper image, the pond, the dell is, is, that we worked on is, is at the very top of the slide. Uh, the, you see the before. The conditions of our site, very linear site, where it was um, it been pretty much scraped and leveled and they piped the stream completely underground here, Meadow Creek, so there was no evident water. And it was a recreation area with a tennis courts that we had to work around, unfortunately, because they were kind of in the way. Uh, basketball courts and parking. So what you see in red is the area we were allowed to work within, and you can see our proposal. Now, I was still teaching at the time, so I thought this was a great opportunity to create a little mini eco-botanic garden. So I actually used uh, all native plants except for a weeping willow that the, that the campus landscape architect insisted on me using. Uh, but other than that, it was um, coastal plants in the lowest part, and then Piedmont and kind of mountain Virginia plants as you got a little higher up, even though the elevations weren't that different. But really, as a t using this as a teaching tool, um, here's a case of, uh, historically, there was a kind of a collapsed remnant garden there. Uh, I wanted to point out this, this something you can barely see because it's clouded in vines. So this is the transformation of what was there to what we built. Kept that little garden folly, so there's a bit of hist cultural history here, but created this new infrastructure for a st stormwater four bay and pond, and we daylit about 1,100 linear feet of the creek. <clears throat> so this may be of interest to uh, water, hydrology, and civil engineering types. Um, there's the pipe that's, that stayed in place. We have an overflow system, so in a major storm, it can still overflow and not blow out the things we designed. Um, but what, what we're showing here is that, it, that that's the normal flow of the stream, a normal, you know, normal mm, 300 days of the year. In a one or two year storm, I can't remember what it is, one year storm, this is what it looks like. And we designed a series of rain gardens that would expand the presence of the stream and allow some infiltration. And the pond was designed so it could flex and absorb X amount of storm water. And then in, in the maximum flood storage, almost the entire site uh, is contained with water, which then infiltrates and or moves on. Uh, here's the, the, the stream portion under construction, kind of weaving around the tennis courts. This is what it was first uh, implemented. Uh, this is a year or two later. It's still used for recreation fields. That stream is behind. And here's what it looks like in the summer, at fully uh, built out and, and fle fleshed out in terms of plants. But the stream is very active. Uh, and full of life. I mean, the, the amount of life that's come back to this place now is incredible. Here's the stream as it enters the, uh, the forebay. We deliberately designed th this to go from a more natural looking system to a very designed system because we wanted to acknowledge that, you know, this was a created and structured place. Uh, it was part of the university community. It was a, it was a, for us, it was an artful piece of civil engineering. So what we would do is take that stream and celebrate that fall in this stone scupper here. And, that's, and it would be designed so that it would really calibrate, it would really help us understand the difference between normal flow, which you see here, and a, and a major flow. So here's normal flow, and this is a storm. So very dramatic. You can see, also see the, how it's contained in a normal flow and how the water lifts up in a storm. We also calibrated a weir for the forebay. And this view is great because it shows the stream coming into the forebay. And the forebay, for those who don't know, you create prior to the major pond so you can actually clean out it out more frequently. It's, it's on a five-year cycle because it'll get sedimented more quickly than the, the lower pond. If you didn't do that, you'd have to clean the whole pond out, uh, and this is the more efficient way of doing it. And you can really, I think if you look carefully, you can sort of see the difference between the quality of the water, look how muddy that is after a storm, and how relatively clean that is. So it does work. It is working. Um, then this is the scupper we created, the little barrier between the forebay and the larger 
a half acre uh, bigger pond below. And you notice that's the normal flow, but we deliberately designed the scupper areas so that in a one year storm, it'll go up to here and a bigger storm, it'll go over the whole thing. It's a, it's a way of, as I said, calibrating or designing so you acknowledge the, the, the dynamic of nature over time. So here's what's happening in a bigger storm as it goes beyond that center scupper to the wider one. I think that has a kind of fluidity and sculptural quality and dynamic all its own. So just a, a couple other views during a storm of that gushing stream coming through the scupper. Um, I said it was, uh, you know, this is a place that's been used now for five or six years by multiple uh, departments and classes in environmental sciences. They're testing water quality and sedimentation, et cetera. We use it for plants classes. Um, civil engineering uses it. So it has become a real demonstration place. One of the things I tried to do from a plant point of view is say, okay, let's, we could actually plant in our coastal zone the, the Magnolia virginiana, which naturally grows in the coastal zone, and con contrast that with a Magnolia tripitala, it, which naturally grows in more upland zones. And so put that up farther, and you can teach the class that they're in the same genus, but in different, um, uh, different species in the same genus, same family as well. And uh, that, that for me is an important kind of botanic and plant-oriented uh, teaching lesson. Try to use, as we said, nat only native plants, but also ones that were productive seasonally and productive from a wildlife point of view. So amelanchier or serviceberry was important. Uh, and, and created these wonderful wetland edges, very planted shelves, which immediately began to attract uh, wildlife that hadn't been there before, the blue heron. Uh, I used itea, native sweet spire, as part of the shrub plantings for the edges. Uh, and you know, one of the attempts here, not just to create a, a, a kind of water quality, a water quantity control stormwater device, but to create a kind of beautiful place that could be used and related to the university's character. But to contrast, the kind of terraced edge of one side of the pond, which had echoes to the terraced lawn of Jefferson, to the more natural and topographic side. So there's this, always this juxtaposition or contrast between those wilder and tamer sides of things. Uh, so it's you know beautiful different times of the year, and it's used year round. Uh, it is a place that measures a dynamic over time. It is a place that's, that really has attracted a great, much greater biodiversity over time, and it's a place that people love. So that's the lecture. I thank you. <laughs> and happy to answer questions. Or so Warren has to head back to Charlottesville, but we have time for a few questions. I do want to mention there that I was really engaged by that talk. It kind of felt like you were working the room a little bit to me. Yeah, <laughs> no. might have been. No. Hey, who's, uh, how many of you are from Charlottesville? And how many from Vienna, Virginia? OK. I'm from Vienna, so, you know. Oakton High School, maybe you went to Madison. Marshall, I don't know. Marshall okay. So. Question, yeah. Um, how often do you speak out uh, projects as compared to just submitting your request? Uh, the ma vast majority of requests um, and, and uh, come through associations and collaborations, but uh, any competition you're seeking out. So uh, we continue to do competitions just because if the project's interesting enough, the site's interesting enough. Um, so, uh, well, you know, when you, when you say that, I should say a lot of professional work uh, doesn't just get handed to you. It, it comes out in the form of a request for proposals or a request for qualifications. So in that sense, we seek it out. But somebody may have alerted us to, you know, going after that competitively. So. Uh, uh, but I, and it's a good question. I think if, if we look at the work right, we're doing right now or the work I just showed, I would say maybe 60% of it we get because of, of uh, associations and collaborations and 40% we've actively or quietly gone after, uh, you know, sought it out. Uh, yeah, sorry. A lot of what? I was wondering about um, the materials that you use when you design stuff aren't um, plants. They're just stones and water spilling in the rock. Right. Do you use any even soft wire or anything? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, everything, virtually everything you see, you, we've designed. And even though people tend to think of landscape architects as plants, people, surprisingly, most landscape architects don't know their plants that well. It's <laughs> terrible to say, but that's true. Um, but what we do is we work with the land, you know, uh, the earth, forming the land, and very much working with stone and wood and metal in what we do. And we give a lot of thought. 
more and more these days, obviously, you, you worry about sourcing that and trying to find local sources or recycled sources for that, if that's the question. I don't know if it is. You don't, don't always, doesn't always work out that way, more because of the client than you. I mean, we, I, can t I can count numerous times when we have specified a local soapstone from a quarry that's 20 miles away or a local granite 50 or 100 miles away. But the client tells you, you know, we can get that from India or China for half the price. And, you know, we complain, but, you know, that they're the ones paying the bill. So that's tough. I like the fact that in St. Louis, the client went along with us saying, we really want to get these as locally as we can. So we got the, the limestone really was right down the river um, and worked with a great local uh, quarrying company, stone company. The granite came up from, from Minnesota, but that's along the Mi Mi Mississippi corridor. So we felt like, you know, this is regional anyway. <laughs> Does that answer your question, or do you have a, yeah? Yep. No, not, not, not would wear, not really would wear away. I mean, there is, I think, a, enough of a pollution. We didn't hear so much about acid rain, but you, we did see a lot of older local buildings that had a kind of blackish stuff that's more urbanization soot and, uh, pollutants. So, you know, that's a, a thing they're trying to be aware of or, or monitor. But they didn't, they didn't give us, a, didn't tell us that was going to be an issue. So, and you know, I, I have a question about that. Maybe some of you guys are more up on this than I am. Acid rain was huge 10 years ago. We, I mean, we'd heard all about it. We were all worried about it. I'm not hearing as much about it now, but is it still as huge a problem in this country? I know it's still a problem in some other countries. I, my sense is that some of the pollutant monitor, monitoring that's been going on with smokestacks, et cetera, has really helped some, and as well as with cars. But you guys know any different than that? It just seems like it's a somewhat improved circumstance. Yep. Well, yeah, it, it depends on the, the ultimately, uh, unfortunately, these things get down to cost. Obviously, when we're working in, with campus settings, a uh, parking garage is much preferable to surface parking, but the cost is exponentially higher. I mean, it's like 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 per space versus 10 or 15,000. So, but um, it just from our point of view, it's much more ultimately sustainable and, and a better use of land if you can stack the cars and concentrate them and limit the car use, et cetera and use the, the surface for something more productive. Ideally, it's landscape of some sort, but even a building that has a higher use and with a green roof is going to be better than just a parking lot. So we all, we know, where we know we have to have surface parking or surfaces for pavement, we're trying to promote as much as we can sustainable, porous pavement. That's also not super cost effective, <clears throat> and it's, you know, there's no, no, no perfect systems out there either. So. You know, we've, we've gotten away with that in some places, but not everybody will go along with that. So, but, but I think they're also improving the technology. It'll only get better. So eventually, I think we'll be much, you know, in a better place in 10 or 15 years, like we will with, as solar costs, panel costs come down. Doug. The question I had for you is, um, you, you showed a lot of images that were really interesting and that probably go out in front of RFPs that, that get noticed, and it's an existing condition juxtaposed to, a, to, a, to uh, some piece of technology that allows you to integrate half image taken by a photograph, half digital image. How hard is that to do, and how frequently do you do it? Uh, it it's getting less and less hard to do, and, and it's where you, we use it all the time. I, I am of a generation that still loves to draw, hand draw, and I still draw. Uh, and our office still prides itself on drawing, hand drawing. But, you know, the computer does 90% of what you see comes out of the office now. And the things we, you can do with Photoshop are tremendous. But I will say this, that um, I have uh, not reflected so much maybe here. 
worked in a number of public parks of late um, where part of the process is community participation and you meet with the community uh, or, or and or representatives um, in various settings <coughs> and you present to them or, and you work with them and uh, of late they have expressed great preference for the hand drawing over the digital stuff and I think it's a, a, because they have a mounting skepticism of developers who are often driving these projects of trying to p pass on slick stuff to them through the graphic you know, process. And, and if they feel like you know, they almost see you do it or they feel the hands that work there, it, they somehow think it's more honest. They've literally said that, you know. So uh, just a little aside there that, that sometimes you can be too slick. Technology can work against you sometimes in a way you wouldn't think. So, yep. Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question. Uh, and I should say that, that when, when I went to school, I don't think they ever told us these projects would take so long, by the way, um, so that you have to have a real commitment to, to get something done. Well, I think if, you, if you're a good designer, you're thinking, you're thinking longer term. And um, uh, probably the most important you thing you do as a designer is, is to develop an enduring framework, or you could say a sustainable framework that can flex and change over time as things deteriorate, you know, things are going to deteriorate or trees are going to grow up and mature or get broken or, you know, die. Uh, pavements are going to buckle. Um, systems are going to fail. So I think the question is, is the framework still there that, that you can adapt newer technologies and sustainable practices to? And I think the best example, I mean, I can think of, of that is Central Park. I mean, Frederick Olmsted designed that in, in Calvary at Ball. 1860s was it? I mean, it's still the, the framework of it is still there. I mean, lots of stuff has changed within it over time, but the character and framework is still very much there. They do adapt some into the, how they make remake fields there or pavements there, or parts of it, but still the essence of it, uh, the idea is there. So that's that's the most important thing. Now, another related, absolutely related. Um, response is uh, the, the whole maintenance and management side of things. And too often designers will design a project, it'll look great the first day or the first year, and then take lots of glossy pictures and get on their way. But it's really, the question is, how, what's it look like in five or 10 years? And it's hard to convince a client of this, but we're working hard to convince them that what part of what we should do is, is a management and maintenance plan that talks about everything from phasing to actual changes that might occur over time so that you can anticipate some of that and, and help you know, inform them about, particularly when you're dealing with, with uh, regenerative landscapes and farm landscapes, you know, it's like, how, how do we keep the invasives out, for instance, over time? What, what's the best management practice? And you know, we, we can only give what's best technology today because you know, you like you're, you're suggesting in five or 10 years, hopefully we'll have some better strategies that are even more uh, biological and sustainable. And not so chemical. Yeah. How often do you private um, jobs like the Washington and Russell? And what kind of what kind of private Well, w w I think lo like a lot of designers and, and landscape architects in particular, you start small and therefore you work on a lot of smaller garden projects and then you get bigger like we are and, and pretty soon it's 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 not so affordable for us to to work on the smaller projects. It's hard hard to say that. I, I don't like that, but that's the reality. We charge too much. Um, but the private practice, uh, the, we still love the private practice and still do some of that selectively. So I w I'll I'll say that even though I'm trying we trying to do more and more public work. But the great thing about private clients, frankly, is they usually give you more latitude to explore new ideas than public bureaucratic agencies do. I mean, it's so surprising. They might say something in their, you know, their agenda or their code of the public about wanting to do something sustainable, but when push comes to shove, they're, they're more, much more bureaucratic and don't let you do as many things as you want to do. But a private client doesn't have those constraints, and as long as they have uh, the willingness to explore and experiment, uh, th that's the greatest thing about working with them, frankly. You have to let them know up front that you, what you might be proposing is May not be a certainty, but it's, you know, are you willing to go along and experiment? And some are and some aren't. Yep.
Well, I would say that's a, a personal thing in terms of both me and several, my partner Thomas. We were, he was married for a while too, uh, to someone who had, had her master's in conservation biology. And um, we do work with scientists though, and very specific animal behavioralists on projects like that, that almost demand it. I didn't show you some of the projects that my partner Thomas has worked on with some private properties where he's actually been able to uh, hire research teams, in this, in this case from the State University of New York, um, who've come down and done kind of bio blitz where they've really studied what is it on the site already and how much biodiversity versus lack thereof and how we could do better to create more biodiversity. So it depends on the circumstance. I think we have a kind of ethical commitment to that, a moral commitment to it. To, and I always say, you know, as a landscape architect, what's fascinating is you always have multiple clients on any project. You have the client that's paying you but you also have the, the land, the environment, and all those who don't speak, uh, uh, which are the animals, but the plants as well. So it's, a, and, and trying to speak for them when a client's telling you to do something else is one of the bigger challenges we have. So, uh, but it's, we, I enjoy it. I grew up with, uh, you know, in, in forests and fields and streams and uh, both overseas and here and, and, and in Vienna. And I, when I grew up in Vienna, there still were streams and forests, which are no longer. And, and honestly, I, I've, I've come to the realization that I think what my career has been dedicated to that I didn't even realize it was dedicated to it was kind of to reclaim the creeks that were lost from my childhood almost literally that and for me it wasn't just the water and the trees it was the salamanders and the turtles and the frog I mean you know I just loved those things and you know the fact that we've been able to create a few places where they've come back I mean to me that, that's no, no higher thrill than that so well other than those kids playing in the fountain at St. In St. Louis that was pretty yeah. And the family's coming to flight. Okay, a lot of, there's lots. Of <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Glad yeah. to do it. <clears throat> <clears throat> Good. Thank you so much.